Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. We continue our discussion of Jeffersonian America. And in this lecture, we'll talk about what is regarded as one of Jefferson's greatest achievements, the Louisiana Purchase, and the Lewis and Clark Expedition, which followed it. So how was Jefferson able to make this purchase happen? Well, in 1800, Spain was in control of the Louisiana Territory, and in a secret treaty with France in 1801, they ceded Louisiana to France in exchange for some territory in Europe. It was widely known that Jefferson coveted the Western Territory. He envisioned a nation of small farmers and landowners, and the West would provide the territory for all American citizens to own land. He was also something of a naturalist and fascinated with the natural wonders of uh, flora and fauna that lay out to the West, and he was personally interested in discovering what was out there. But in negotiating with France, he didn't set out to purchase all of Louisiana. In fact, what he wanted most was the port of New Orleans, and he sent James Monroe to Paris to negotiate for the purchase of exactly that, the port of New Orleans. Now, historians have debated the next part of the story for years, because why exactly did the French agree to sell all of Louisiana rather than just the port of New Orleans? Well, France, under the control of Napoleon Bonaparte, held New Orleans, and some say he had visions of an empire on the North American continent. But most historians believe he was hoping to use Louisiana as a source of raw materials for his richest jewel in the Americas, Haiti, the rich Caribbean island. And we talked about a similar kind of situation earlier in the course when we talked about the origins of the South Carolina colony being a source of raw materials for Barbados. So this is not entirely far-fetched. For years, the French had been struggling to subdue a slave revolt in Haiti, and we see a picture uh, depicting that slave revolt. And in 1803, they conceded defeat in that revolt. The slaves in Haiti actually prevailed, winning their independence. That's an important context for what is going to happen next. So how does the Louisiana Purchase happen? Well, obviously Jefferson plays a role in this, and some historians are critical of Jefferson's uh, actions during this period, saying that he played a dangerous game of brinksmanship with a potentially very deadly rival in France, uh, and that perhaps he got lucky in this case and prevailed. Others say that he deployed brilliant strategy and that he kind of forced Napoleon to yield to his genius. It seems more likely that the former is true in this case, that uh, the United States, still at that time a relatively new and untested power, wasn't in a great position to challenge one of the greater powers like France, but he was fortunate, and the slave rebellion in Haiti was a significant part of this story. So what did Jefferson do? Well, on the one hand, he did support the slaves who were rebelling in Haiti. And as I've noted, the, those slaves were eventually victorious. He also began moving Indian tribes from the east to the Louisiana Territory, which provided another kind of snag for Napoleon to have to deal with if he's going to hold on to that territory. And we're going to talk much more later about the removal of Indians from the east to the west. And finally, Jefferson began to arm as if preparing for conflict. He sent 15 gunboats and 80,000 troops in the direction of New Orleans. So how does Napoleon respond? Well, he could potentially have gotten angry about this and sent his own forces to North America. Or he could have just kind of maintained the status quo, dealt with the United States later. Or we could see what actually played out, uh, arranging for the Louisiana Purchase. 
So first, and again, the slaves in Haiti won their rebellion. And if that was the primary motivation for holding on to Louisiana, well, then that primary motivation is lost. They no longer need Louisiana for its raw materials and food production to maintain Haiti. Haiti was lost. Also, Napoleon is preparing at that time to go to war with England. And so what he needed more than this colony and territory far across the globe was cash and kind of removing distractions. He certainly didn't need a, a conflict in North America when he was preparing to go to war with England. So when James Monroe arrived in Paris asking about purchasing the port of New Orleans, he was shocked when the French representative, Talleyrand, offered the entirety of the Louisiana Territory for only $15 million. Now, of course, Monroe was thrilled with that deal, and he agreed to the purchase, although, looking back on it, there were many in the country who had their doubts about whether Jefferson and Monroe even had the authority to make that deal. But perhaps as a final stroke of fortune, communication and travel being such as it was at that time, it would have taken weeks for word to get back and forth and authorization to go across the oceans. So Monroe agreed to the deal, the French took it, and ultimately it was approved and accepted. And in making this purchase, Jefferson essentially doubled the size of the Union and then set about to discover the immense natural resources contained within those lands, along with full access to the Mississippi River. Having obtained the territory of Louisiana, Jefferson now was eager to explore it. As I've mentioned, he was something of a naturalist himself. He was immensely curious about all kinds of things, and he was eager to find out what treasures awaited in this newly acquired territory. And so he organized what we now know as the Lewis and Clark Expedition. He had a number of goals in doing this. First of all, he just wanted to know what was out there. What had we purchased? Uh, what was the land like? What kind of plants, animals, terrain? What kind of people are out there? So surveying the land was a major part of this. He also wondered if there was a navigable route to the West Coast. This, this harkens back to the, the long-time quest from the earliest um, explorers of North America, wondering if there might be a water route all the way from the east to the west. There remained perhaps a slim chance, but some chance that they might discover that water route. He also wanted to secure claim to the fur trade of the west, which was contested with the British in Canada. And he wanted to establish and secure relations with the Indians of the West. For all of this, he signed up Meriwether Lewis, a captain in the military and a close friend of Jefferson. Jefferson personally trained Lewis in the art of politics and then had a number of experts train him in such things as botany, astronomy, zoology, and navigation. By the time of his voyage in 1804, Lewis was as well trained for a particular task as perhaps anyone has ever been. Over the next three years, Lewis and his partner, William Clark, led a group of 25 men called the Corps of Discovery on one of the great American adventures. They traveled upstream on the Mississippi River and then upstream on the Missouri River to its farthest reaches. They traveled farther across North America than any white men had gone. They were accompanied at least part of the way by Sacagawea, an Indian woman who helped them in dealing with the Indians. And of course, it is well known that having Sacagawea in their midst signaled to Indians they met along the way that their expedition was a friendly one rather than a military conquest. They survived a difficult winter in the Rocky Mountains and ultimately reached the West Coast. Along the way, they met Indian groups who had virtually no knowledge of the white men and survived several dangerous skirmishes along the way. Then they survived the return journey as well, and incredibly, only one member of the Corps of Discovery died 
throughout the entire journey. This is one of the most written about tales in American history. There are dozens of books, and at times these books read better than a work of fiction. There were numerous skirmishes with Indians along the way. They nearly starved and at one point had to eat their horses. There were many fights against bears and other creatures along the way. It's just a great adventure story. I'm going to read you just one part of the journal of Meriwether Lewis, which is an incredible and remarkable document for many different reasons. But this will let you know just some of the kinds of things they encounter, bearing in mind that they are completely cut off from any kind of aid and assistance, and if any of their men were to be wounded, uh, seriously injured or killed, they would have no recourse and no way to handle it. This describes a skirmish with some Indians in which a group of Indians had stolen some of their guns while they slept. So here are just a few sentences from this description. The moment the fellow touched his gun, Drewer, who was awake, jumped up and wrested her from him. The noise awoke Captain Lewis, who instantly started from the ground and reached to seize his gun, but finding her gone, drew a pistol from his belt and turning about saw the Indian running off with her. He followed him and ordered him to lay her down. Now her, in this case, is the gun. Which he was doing, just as the fields came up and were taking aim to shoot him, when Captain Lewis ordered them not to fire, as the Indians did not appear to intend any mischief. He dropped the gun and was going slowly off, as Drewer came out and asked permission to kill him. But this Captain Lewis forbid, as he had not yet attempted to to shoot us. So you see they have this narrow escape and there are many stories like this throughout the journals of Meriwether Lewis. Imagine if those men had fired on the Indians, sparked an outright war, and surely the Corps of Discovery would all have been slaughtered. Now sadly the story of Meriwether Lewis ends badly. At the end of the journey his journals must have been worth a gold mine. They were an incredible document. He was offered many thousands of dollars to publish them, uh, which by the standards of that day would have been an immense fortune. But inexplicably, he never made an effort to do so. It seemed he tried a few times to write them into publishable form, but writer's block always seized him and he could never get it done. He eventually was named the governor of, Louis of the Louisiana Territory by Jefferson, but he just wasn't any good at the job. He was perfectly suited for the adventure, but he was no administrator uh, in this sense. He used the position to jockey for his own personal trading interests and actually made a lot of enemies along the way. Eventually, he was called to Washington to answer to his charges and at that point suffered a breakdown and committed suicide before reaching Washington. So, this incredible story has a tragic ending for Lewis. And before concluding the story, I just want to show you one page from the journal of Meriwether Lewis to give you a sense of what we're talking about. This is a sketch that Lewis drew of, obviously, one of the fish uh, he encountered. The journals are filled with these kind of sketches of all kinds of animals that uh, the Europeans had no idea were there along with descriptions uh, in the background. And you get a sense from looking at this page that the journal itself is actually akin to a work of art. It is just uh, an amazing document in its own right. So, in the next few lectures, we will talk about the outcomes of the Louisiana Purchase and other elements of Jefferson's presidency.